Income tax 2021-2022 software example, reporting rental income, expenses, and losses. Get ready to get refunds to the max diving into income tax 2021-2022. Lacert Tax Software, you don't need tax software to follow along, but you might want to have access to the forms and schedules which you can find on the IRS website at irs.gov, irs.gov starting point. We got the single filer, Adam Smith, living in Beverly Hills, 90210, starting with the W-2 income at the 100000 12550 standard deduction to get us down to the taxable income, 87450 Page 2, calculating the tax at the 15015 line number six back to page one and we're thinking about the rental property now which typically would be reported on the schedule e but you can imagine situations where you might report it on the schedule c so just to take a look at those differences we'll go back and forth from a w-2 income here to the schedule c and then spend more time on the schedule e when might you report the rental income on a schedule c as opposed to a schedule e Let's go to a quick recap. Schedule C, Form 1040, Profit or Loss from Business. Generally, Schedule C is used when you provide substantial services in conjunction with the property or the rental is part of a trade or business as a real estate dealer providing substantial services. What does that mean? If you provide substantial services that are primarily for the tenant's convenience, such as regular cleaning, changing linen, or maid service, you report your rental income and expenses uh, on Schedule C. So it's kind of like more you'd be doing stuff that you might expect like in a hotel, which has a substantial service component to it. Use form 1065, U.S. return of partnership income if your rental activity is a partnership, including a partnership with your spouse, unless it is qualified joint venture. So we have that partnership type of situation. The partnership return would then be reporting the income flowing then through to the uh, 1040s for the partners with the use of the K1s. Substantial services don't include the furnishing of heat and light, cleaning of public areas, trash collection, etc. For more information, you can see publication 334. So the W-2 situation is fairly straightforward. Let's go to the Schedule C type of situation. Let's say we remove, remove the income from the W-2 and then we go to the Schedule C first and then we'll go to the schedule e it says a restaurant but we're assuming it's it's rental property here we're going to say this is 120,000, and then i'll put 20,000 in just some random expense for accounting got to pay our accountant well right and then we're going to go back on over and say this is going to be the forms and so now we've got the schedule c so now when it flows in to page one it's going through line eight if I go to the Schedule C, just to look at the distinctions between the schedules and to consider what you as the taxpayer might be wanting to do uh, in terms of how you're going to re re report in your income or how you want to set things up uh, would be on the Schedule C. You've got the 120 minus the expenses, the expenses, of course, being deductible in order to generate revenue if they're ordinary and necessary. That gets us to the 100,000. That 100,000 then flows to the Schedule 1. And on the Schedule 1, we have our income. That's going to go then to the 1040. Here it is on the 1040. However, we also have the self-employment tax. And this is huge because that's what could be a distinguishing factor. That's reported here. This is the Social Security and Medicare. And it's being calculated at the 14129, which flows through to the Schedule 2. There's the 14129, which flows through to the 1040 page number two so now we not only have the tax being calculated up top but we also have the uh, added tax that's being included in which is the self-employment tax now half of that tax is deducted for self-employment over here if i go back to the self-employment half of it's deducted so that's going to be flowing through to the schedule one and page two so there's the 7065 which flows into the form 1040 so now we've got the 100,000 but we get to deduct at least some of the self-employment tax to bring down the adjusted gross income. And we've got the qualified business income deduction I won't get into in detail here that may apply. And so we could that could be a factor as well. And then on page two, we've got the federal income tax and then you got that huge uh, social security. So those are some of the things that could be a factor. Now also realize that if you had a loss with the Schedule C, it's likelier, more likely that you don't have as many restrictions to take it.
So in other words, if I had my loss was, if I said this was 150, let's say it was 200,000. So I lost uh, 80,000, right? If I go back to my schedule C, now I've got a loss of the, of, uh, the 80,000. That's flowing ultimately through to the form 1040. Now I don't have any income against it. If I had W2 income, I might be able to take that against the W2 income depending on the circumstances or at least I have less restriction to do that. So now I got W2 income. I've got this huge loss. And because I was actively participating, the assumption being in the Schedule C, I'm not running into the same kind of passive activity rules and limitations. Now, just realize that if you're a married, if you're married, you also have that kind of situation you got to deal with with um, the Social Security in particular. So, if I say we're, we're married now, for taxes, you're kind of one entity for federal income taxes, but the Social Security is still applied out per person. So you've, you you got to determine what state like what state you're in to see if you can. I'm going to bring this back to let's bring this back to twenty thousand to determine if you're in joint custody property or so. On. You might be able to then say that it's a joint return now. And then if I go back on over just to get an idea of this, um, is it community? Is it a community property state or not? Could have an impact on your capacity to to make. Uh, do this process. So then we have the Schedule C. So we got the same 100,000 and the 100,000. But the point is that here, if it flows into the Schedule SE, then you actually have two of them because the self-employment needs to be applied out to the two here, Adam and Eve, so that when they get their benefits, they have this taken into consideration. That's one of the big factors with the Schedule C uh, why why it's important to have that breakout uh, broken out properly. So another way you could do that is of course treat the two the two married couples uh, individuals as a partnership and file the partnership return and have the K1 flow through to the two individuals as well. And then you can also look under the rules for a qualified joint venture as well to, for the reporting uh, rules. But I'm going to go back to the taxpayer here. And we're going to bring it back to a single. Let's bring it back to single now. And so then if I go back on over, now we have the single file. Let's get rid of the W-2 income. And now let's move it on over to uh, the Schedule E. So I'm going to go over to the Schedule E. So this is where we're at now. So I'm going to go back on over here and say, let's remove the Schedule C stuff. And let's move to the Schedule E which I'm not going to put just the 100,000. We got a little bit more complex stuff, but now we've got the Schedule E. So I'm going to go on over to the Schedule E. So instead of the Schedule C, which now has nothing in it, although we still have it there because I, I didn't delete the cut, we got to go to Schedule E. So the Schedule E now is going to give us the property. It looks a little bit different in the layout, but it's in essence a, an income statement. So we have the, pro the revenue minus the expenses. We got some more expenses that are involved here. Uh, let's bring it so that we have income on it to start off with. And so I'm going to go back down and say we have income. So there's going to be our income. And then that is going to flow in to the Schedule 1. So there it is on Schedule 1. And then the Form 1040. I didn't do the exact same amount of income, but there's the 1040. And then we don't have the self-employment tax. So then we got the standard deduction. We don't see uh, line 13, generally the qualified business income. And there's the tax, but then on page two, we don't see that other tax for the self-employment possibly. So you got some kind of pros and cons with the Schedule C to the Schedule E, meaning Schedule C, you might you don't have to worry about the passive loss kind of stuff so much, uh, so that could make things easier. But you might have the self-employment tax that uh, is going to be involved in it as well. And so there's you know if you're trying to think about how you're going to structure your business to see where you will categorize. You got to take those things into consideration if you're kind of on the border. Now, if you have losses, that's when this whole kind of thing comes into play on the schedules E, because on the schedule E, note that if I if I invest into a property, then I probably am, am hoping that just the value of the property goes up. I'm not just making money 
on the rental activity like I might be doing with a Schedule C like service business where I'm just trying to generate revenue from year to year. Schedule E, I'm hoping the property goes up in value. So that means that yeah, I could take losses and still be fairly content. So and note the IRS is more skeptical, therefore, of losses. So you can see those down here, the form 6198 and the form 8582 are going to be some of the things that you be concerned with with losses. Now, if you have income, then the IRS is happy to take their share. Not a, not a problem. But if you have a loss, then that's when it gets into uh, the problems that could happen. So let's say we have a loss here. Let's bring the loss uh, up. So I'll say that we've got, let's say this is... 180,000 and that should bring us to a loss right so now we have the loss so the income is at the 120,000 minus then the expenses minus the expenses of 194,040 with a loss 74,040 we've got the two things that could take place that would limit the loss those would be the at risk rules and then the the passive activity rules Again, these kind of apply to the losses because if you had income, the IRS is happy to take their share of the income. If they have losses, the IRS might limit those losses. Now, the first one is not as likely to be applicable for like individual, most investors reporting on a Schedule E. It might be more likely on a pass-through type of entity like a partnership or an S corporation. And it could arise, for example, if, if you're hitting the at-risk rules, meaning you're not at risk, possibly due to, for example, having a loan, let's say, where they don't have the recourse towards you if you default on the loan. So you've invested money that you're not really at risk for. That's the kind of limitation that would be involved there for most people that are investing in the property that aren't like reported on a Schedule E then you are at risk uh, at that point. That's why the passive rules are usually the ones that are going to kind of uh, kick in there. But that form 6198 is down here. We're going to say 6198. You can check it out. Form 6198 is the at-risk at limitations. And obviously you can look at the instructions and so on for it to dive into it in more depth if it's applicable. And then we've got the, uh, the passive activity rules which are form 8582. And that one you can see is kicking in here. Form 8582 is the passive activity loss limitation. So we had our loss of the 74,040. And then you've got your, your limitation that is taking place and ultimately calculating down here to give you that 25. So we'll go into that in a bit more detail in a second. But first, let's just, just imagine that if we put in an at-risk kind of limit here up top, that one would be applied out. So I could say, okay, what if we said that we had the amount at risk was 50000 just to see that apply out here. And so now you've got it limited. So our loss was at 7440 and it limited, you know, limited here and then it limited with the 25000 so let's go back on over and say that's not often may not be the case. And let's go back on over to here. So now we've got the loss of the 74,040, but it's being limited to the 25,000 down below. Now, this is where the three kind of terms come, come into play, meaning is it completely passive? Do you actively participate or, you know, are you a real estate professional? So actively participating is usually what is required to get this deduction to 25,000. So if I went back on over, for example, and we said that we did not actively participate, if we did not actively participate, then uh, you're gonna have a you're gonna have a limitation and you can see the loss then not flowing in to the first page of the form 1040. Even if I had some other income here, you might have like W2 income, for example of the 100,000, 100,000 that you'd like to take a loss against. So it's not flowing through. But if I say I actively participate, so we're going to say, okay, I actively participate, then now that 25,000 uh, is flowing through here that you could see the activity basically flowing through from the Schedule E. And then if I say I'm a real estate professional, if I say I'm a real estate professional, <clears throat> then the software 
is saying I'm going to allow the 74, 40 in essence rolling rolling through here so those terms are going to be important and you're going to want to be thinking okay what is it what do i need to do to go from completely passive if i have a loss particularly to be actively participating to be like a real estate professional now that twenty five thousand will will phase out so let's bring it back to the twenty five thousand, and let's say that we actively participate so that we get that that twenty five thousand so if your AGI goes over like 100,000, then that could start to, to phase out. So let's say that I've got income of 120,000 and I go back on over to the forms. You can see it's basically phasing out with, a, with an income limitation, which you could see on the calculation for the passive activity rules here. I won't go through the whole calculation, but you got basically the limitation that is going to be imposed upon it for your AGI as you go over the 100,000. Okay, so let's bring it back then to to the 100,000. So now we're picking up that that loss at the 25 again, and you would think that the, everything should double if you got married now. So if if Sam got married to or Adam got married to Eve here, then we're going to say okay, but now they, they're married now. So married filing jointly and we pull it back on over. And you'd think that you'd think maybe you'd get like 50,000 of the loss, but no, like even if I say it's a joint venture here, we're gonna say it's at, you know, the, 20, the 25,000 on the loss and the limitation is similar too. So if I bring the income up over the 100,000 for the phase out, you think the phase out would be like 200,000 now, 120,000. Now for the married, it's still reducing the loss. So it's kind of a kind of a funny funny thing for the for the that 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 weird rule and you can see it kind of happened kind of like strangely in the law. You can imagine what happened. They said people are taking advantage of the rental real estate losses that on this passive activity so we need to just make it all passive and then they make it all passive but then you got real estate professionals saying that's not fair because other people get to take losses and i'm an actual real estate professional you're hurting me so we're going to put it back in but we're going to put these weird rules on it and then the real weird rules don't make a lot of sense when you go from married to married filing separate to single to so on so you know it gets kind of that's where it landed now when you got the depreciable stuff you might have to file the form uh, 4562 depreciation and amortization and you can see some of is recaps you know some of the depreciation and amortization here and typically the software will have a more in-depth schedule which won't just group it by the categories here but give you the give you the the play-by-play -play, as we saw in a prior presentation when we entered this information for the building the furniture and the land and so on and so forth so you might not be required to attach a schedule like this but you should have a schedule like this and if you're going from one tax preparer to another tax preparer in particular the new one's going to need a schedule like this even if it's not required to be filed with the tax return so just uh, keep that in mind now you could also have a situation we have multiple properties now. So now you can see on the form, we've got property A, property B, and then the information related to them. I'm going to say 365 on 365 on this one too. And so you got your income statement for property A and property B. And so I just put two in here. One has a loss, the other have income. If they're similar in nature in terms of their passive you know, activity status, you would think that even though you can't take the 74,040 against W-2 income, you're limited in the passive activity rules possibly to the 25,000, that you could take it against other similar passive activity income. So in this case, we've got the two properties that are kind of similar in nature. So you would think that you could uh, net them out would be the general idea. So uh, you could have a, you could also think about the choice to treat all interests as one activity and make a type of election at that, just to give a quick uh, look at that here. 
if you were a real if you were a real estate professional and had more than one rental real estate interest during the year so for a real estate professional remember those big terms are you completely passive actively participating or a real estate professional you can choose to treat all the interest as one activity uh, you can make this choice for any tax year that you qualify as a real estate professional that is uh, if you forego making the choice for one year, you can still make it for a later year. If you make the choice, it is binding for the tax year you make it and for any later year that you are a, re that you are a real estate professional. Now, if we go back to the original scenario, you also have this issue of this unallowed kind of loss that we have here. So if we've got a loss of the 75 or the 74040 and we only get to take 25 then are we just going to lose the 49 uh 40 and you can kind of see the calculation of that on the passive activity here so we see the loss calculation and then the 4940 the unallowed loss now generally you would think you could take that and roll it forward into the next period to basically see if we have income in the next period possibly taking the, you know the loss up to 25,000 in the following period and then if and then taking you know if there's any income against it you can basically net it out what you can't do of course is net it out against the the ordinary income so they're kind of like two income streams in their own track you got to net out losses against losses that are of a similar nature passive a nature in this case so for example if you had prior year losses of a hundred thousand that, that you're going to roll forward into the current year, then you couldn't really take them because you already have losses in the current year. But you could see it kind of calculated on the passive activity. So these are the current year losses, the prior year losses, the 174,000. And then on page two, then we've got the losses that would be carrying forward, which would be the prior year losses plus the current year losses minus what we're taking in the current year of the 25,000 to be rolling forward the unallowed 149.40. So now let's say we had income in the current year. We had 100,000 loss that we're carrying forward and we had income in the current year. And so let's say that on the schedule E, we had income of, of the 100,000 or so. And so we'll say, okay, now we've got income here and so the revenue minus the expenses is going to be the income which was 120,000 minus the expenses which come out to 34 minus 34040 that gives us our 85960 and now we've got this amount coming in from the passive not limiting us but possibly allowing us a deduction that's kind of rolling over from the prior year at uh, the 100,000, which is netting out. So then if I go to the passive rules, you can see here now we've got the, the 85,000 active and then the 100,000 prior year to give us that 1414, which is rolling in to the 1040. So even though we have income, we're netting out the 100,000 that we rolled for, that we didn't get to take, we're imagining in the prior year and then we would still have the limitation of the 25,000 that we didn't get to in the current year. So if I made, for example, my income a little bit less, like 40,000, then we get that 25,000 uh, limit that we're going to be, that we're going to have. So basically if you got the loss and you're an active participant, it might be capped at that 25,000 or less if you got the phase out for the AGI limitation and then you might be able to get a benefit by rolling it forward but you're only going to get a benefit if it's not already being eaten up by losses in the future year 25,000 possibly a, a year anything else rolls forward until it can be matched up against some other kind of form of passive income is kind of the general idea that you'd want in your head.